Okay, I'm here at the Miniman National Park. It's not actually open. I'm here participating with a group of reenactors who've been preparing and drilling today for the upcoming events because it is soon, um, soon upon us. What we're doing today is assembling uh, cartridges without ball, just powder, for reenactors on Battle Road. Very exciting to uh, come and hear all the stories from everybody. This year I'm just going to be a spectator, so this is kind of a good way for me to get a sense of what's going on. Hello everyone, James McQuibby here. This is the day after what you just saw. I was yesterday with Minuteman National Park, as you saw, helping to assemble cartridges. Uh, cartridges for the many reenactments that are going to be coming up. Um, the land between Lexington and Concord that is now called Battle Road, which is the road that the Colonials battled the British regulars on April 19th, 1775, what we call Patriot's Day here, and was the day that started the Revolutionary War. That land is administered by the National Park Service, which makes it federal land, and so for reenactors to participate on it, they have to adhere to the standards set by the National Parks, and that includes not bringing your own powder and certainly not bringing any lead ball to fire. So the reenactors have to come and they have to use the cartridges that are provided by the National Park Service. Now someone has to make those cartridges and that's what that whole group of reenactors, after they did a drill in the morning where they're preparing to demonstrate that they know how to handle themselves and to uh, handle their muskets appropriately, meaning that they can have, they can be called to arms and stand and fire and everything in the proper sequence according to the proper verbal commands. They did all that in the morning, I wasn't with them, and then in the early afternoon they met together to uh, assemble 2,000 cartridges, I believe was the goal that day. And it's a little bit of an assembly line, somebody rolls the, the paper um, into the tube, Someone fills it with powder, that was me. I was doing just powder, powder, powder. Doing about 100 grams of, uh, grams, grains. 100 grains of Schutzen 2F powder, the same powder that I'm using here um, for most of my cartridges these days. And um, yeah, we were just there. It was a really delightful time and uh, very enjoyable. As they're all getting ready for what's coming up here very soon. I think this year, the Monday closest to Patriots Day, the third Monday of the month, is the 17th. That'll be the day we run the Boston Marathon here. Um, and just, you know, frankly, a wonderful, uh, exciting time. So for the reenactors, of course, this year, because I haven't been able to drill and uh, do everything I'm supposed to do, I won't be participating as a reenactor. Um, I still have one more year. I can do that next year to qualify to do it again in two years, which will be the 250th anniversary of Patriots Day. Very excited about that. Um, I think it's just a wonderful opportunity to participate in living history. Um, and just another great reason to live in and around Boston. Uh, if you've never tried it, I recommend it. So here I am in my garage, though, doing all of those cartridges has reminded me. Oh, I should just quickly say all of those cartridges are blanks. They're filled only with powder, and then they're folded up. I'll show you a, a finished cartridge that has a ball in it. It looks like this. Um, so you can see the fold in the paper that allows you to slip the edge of the cartridge down in here. It makes a nice little thing. So I've got it tied off with some with some uh, twine. And then there's the ball. You can see that rounded area is the ball. Um, in the version that we were doing there, there's no ball. It's just the powder. And that's how you shoot a blank. Um, it also means it's super easy to uh, load and fire those. <laughs> you don't have to pour the powder and then stick the ball in and jam the ball in. They, in fact, I've seen reenactors who just pour the powder down and then fire and they don't worry super much about ramming it in because you're not trying to compact a ball uh, to ensure that there's proper uh, ignition from the powder to the ball. Um, so anyway, I I've never participated in that before and the only blanks I've ever fired were blanks I invented on my own. I just basically made one of these that I'm about to make right now for you um, but without a ball and it worked just fine. But uh, what I'm realizing is they don't even tie off the bottom because there's no ball to tie off. So, so many things to learn and just such great, generous people. That's been the theme of all of my videos is that everywhere I go in this whole process, everyone is just generous, very welcoming, very eager to say, oh, you want to sit down and, and fill powder cartridges for us? Go right ahead. And then they let me in on their conversations and chatter. And here's one of the reasons I was super excited to be with them. I had a conversation I was hoping to overhear, and I was able to. And it was a conversation about something that happened a week ago in Westford, Massachusetts. Now, 
This did not make national headlines. It only barely showed up in the local news, but this is a big deal. What happened is we had a, a militia group of reenactors in associated with Westford. I can't remember the name of the regiment that they have given themselves, but um, look, accidents happen. People maybe need to be more careful sometimes and, and something, well, they, well, let me just show you what happened. What you're looking at here is a still shot of a beam in the Westford Town Museum. It's a small little museum that recognizes the historical roots of the town. And this is where this particular militia group had gathered to uh, prepare their drills for the upcoming reenactment season. And well, this hole that you're looking at in this six inch beam occurred because a musket was accidentally fired inside the museum with powder and ball in it and that ball at an angle luckily went up through this post and into wedged into another beam that is in the ceiling between the first and second floors this is unthinkable now one of the reasons that I wanted to go and hang out with these folks is because I was pretty sure someone there would have the inside scoop on how this could possibly happen look People take this so seriously. Like they are so safety minded. Um, there is, I've seen so many people who have been very cautionary about how these muskets are handled, whether they're loaded or not. And uh, well, in this case, what I found was, um, well, the individuals involved, which some of the people that I was with yesterday know some of the people that were involved, and so they were discussing it. But here's, here's what essentially happened. The company had been doing a drill at a prior date. I don't know how many days ago, weeks ago it was. And for whatever reason, a gentleman loaded his musket, so he had ball and powder, and maybe he fired or was trying to fire and it misfired and the pan flashed and it didn't load or didn't ignite and the ball didn't get out. And he then went home with the ball still in there and left it there. Or he loaded it and just never got around to firing it and still left it there, either way. The situation of the firearm, the musket, uh, at the incident was that there was no powder in the pan, which was part of what I always think is like, why would someone have a pan that is primed and ready to go inside a building? There's no reason to do that ever. And I'm told that it wasn't primed. That instead, the charge that was the ball and powder charge that was inside the musket had been left over from the prior event. It had never been cleaned out and removed. Um, I guess they just forgot that there was still a ball in there. And then when they were inside the building, perhaps, I'm still not sure about this, no one knows for sure, but the weapon was cocked, it takes two clicks to cock it, and the trigger was pulled. Now, you would have pulled the frizzen down because you don't want to dry fire a flint. It'll just blow that flint right out and send it across the room. Um, but if you have the frizzen there, you can have a spark and there's no gunpowder in the pan if you didn't prime it, so it should be okay, right? But there could be residue in the pan because they didn't clean it. We know they didn't clean it because the musket would have been cleaned, the ball would have been retrieved. So um, <laughs> there could have been residue and that could have been enough to ignite it. The residue could even be all the way through the vent, the little hole where the spark travels to ignite the actual powder charge. Or that flint, and this was the joke that some of the people were making yesterday, is the flint was just so darn sharp and such a good, nice, fresh piece of flint that it sparked so large that it didn't need any powder that the spark actually went directly into the, into, the, um, uh, in, into the hole and went all the way across into the musket and triggered the charge that was sitting there inside the, the, the barrel. Now, I don't know which of those it is, but I know this, all of the reenactor community is just now on edge because they're expecting that people are gonna be very nervous around them, very worried about them, their safety standards and so on. So believe me, Everyone's going to be extra careful to show that they're that they're being safe, that they're doing what they're supposed to do. Anyway, that was that was the kind of the big the big news this week was oh my goodness how in the world uh, could this have happened? And now it appears it's just a pure accident. Accidents happen. That's fine. But a good reminder to all of us about how we should handle our our weapons. Okay, um, I need to update you on some of my kit, and I'll fulfill a promise that I made a couple of videos ago. So. I am now to the point where I'm almost fully ready. I have from Blue Box Sutlery a uh, my very own cartridge. Um, 
satchel or pouch. Uh, oh, there's a name for this. Cartridge box. Here we go. And the, the beautiful thing about this, so it's leather, it's made to the period specifications. I'm probably going to be dyeing this strap uh, to be a dark brown, but anyway, it's a nice, nice black uh, waterproofing cover on the inside. And then this, this is where you store your cartridges. So once you make these rounds, uh, you have them all ready to go, you stuff them in here, and then you've got 20 in my case ready to go so that when you're out there fighting uh, with the British regulars, you've got 20 shots that you could use in any one particular battle before you have to go get out your powder horn and try to make some more cartridges or get more cartridges from the supply wagon. So very excited about this. Has that new leather smell. Love it. I also have my, from the Blue Box Cutlery as well, my strap for my musket. You're not allowed to bring a musket to these reenactments if it doesn't have a strap and mine doesn't have a strap. So here we go. I'll probably also dye that brown. I've got an official dust uh, a pan um, brush or whisk and the, uh, the purpose is to after your uh, pan starts to get fouled from different residue you can brush it away and that would prevent misfires like the one that happened inside the museum and then this is just a pick to clean out the, um, the vent to make sure that you've got nice transmission of ignition um, across. So I'm getting all my kit, getting really excited about it, but here's what I promised a little while ago. I promised that I would make a video of what I called the perfect brown bass cartridge. And uh, now having participated in making several thousand of them yesterday for the short time that I was there with them, a couple hours that I was there with them, um, I, I'm now eager to come back and try this. What I've been doing is I've been listening to people who tell me different materials that I should use. So the materials that I've been using up until now I've been using the original masking paper that came from uh, Jefferson Arsenal, which I bought a kit from them originally to learn how to make these. And I'm trying to find the template. This is the template they sent. This is just regular paint masking paper that you can get at any hardware paint store. Um, I have since bought my own roll of these so I can cut it out. It's a little thinner than the one they had, which I think is good. So we'll try that one today. I have the newsprint that I've been using, purchased at Staples in a, just a what looks like an art portfolio kind of configuration. I have two different kinds of tissue paper. I've had several people say, just use the tissue paper that comes with packaging or um, in that kind of thing. I say, okay, I'll try it out. I, they feel a little fragile to me. We'll see how that works. And then other people who say, go original, use newsprint. Now, I don't get a newspaper, and I don't know to what degree this newsprint has the same weight of newsprint from the old days. But we'll, we'll go with it, actual newsprint, as opposed to the kind you buy from Staples. I'm going to be using three different kinds of thread to tie it off with. I've got this original one that I've been using for a while just because I had it handy. It's a cotton 10-gauge um, crochet thread. That's what it is. I'm not a crochet guy, but um, I did. this was easy for me to get my hands on, so I got it. Now, gauge in thread is just like gauge in uh, wire, is that the smaller the number, the thicker it is. So this is a 10 gauge. Um, let's see if you can kind of appreciate how thick that is. Too thick. Uh, I've been using it, and it's fine. But then I thought, well, let me see if I can get some 20 gauge, and I couldn't. I didn't have any. Not, not very common, I guess. So I've got 30 gauge. And the 30 gauge is very, very fine. It's cotton, which they wouldn't have used back then. Cotton thread was not commonly available. Cotton was not mass produced yet. Um, what they would have used was linen thread. And so I did buy some linen thread as well very recently. Uh, let's see if I've got it here somewhere. The original container. Yeah, so here it is. Unbleached, unwaxed linen thread. And I use a lot of linen thread now in all my sewing projects. It just has a different feel to it. It's got a little more grit to it than the cotton does. I mean, that's the reason why we wear cotton clothes instead of linen these days is that linen is a little itchier, a little um, coarser. Uh, but anyway, that's what they would have used was linen thread. I don't know what gauge they would have used. This gauge is 35, I believe. Yeah, 35 gauge, um, three ply, uh, if that matters to any of you out there. So I've got five papers and I'm gonna just tilt this down here. It's my little workstation and we're gonna get cooking. So the materials that I need, uh, as you've seen me do this before perhaps, is I need the papers. Do, do, do. I've got them five. I've got the to tie off. I've got the shot cord that I'm gonna to use to tie the end. Here's one that I have almost finished uh, without the powder in it. So uh, you tie off the end where the ball is, is housed and it's separated. The ball is separated from the powder by paper that's folded in. So 
I'm going to do that um, these five times. I'll speed up the video so that you don't have to watch me go through the slow process. I haven't, I've probably done a hundred of these in my life. And um, no, actually I've done more than that now, 150 probably. Uh, but I haven't done them in a month or so. So we'll see if I remember how. Uh, let's start with the one that I'm least confident in. And we'll do the tissue papers. I'll do the two, two tissue papers. I'll do the old style newsprint, the new style newsprint. And then finally the masking, the paint masking paper. And we'll go from there, and we'll talk about some few things after that. And uh, here we go. Okay, so let me do my review here. Uh, as you saw, actually they all worked really surprisingly well. Um, I'm sorry that the light's a little dark. You can see in the background there my Springfield Armory 1794 to 1968 poster. It's got all the Springfield models from the first Flintlock model in 1795 down to the M14, final US rifle that was made there in the 1960s. Okay, um, here's, here was the surprise. This guy worked remarkably well. It's not a thin tissue paper. I don't know how to describe the difference between this tissue paper and the kind that you might find in someone's gift bag, because a gift bag tissue paper tears way more easily than this. This seemed to go very well, and it's very robust. You can see actually it's semi-transparent. Uh, so you can see the ball hanging out in there. I'll get the powder in in just a minute. Uh, the, the fail points in making a cartridge are always this point when you're going to twist it with the shock cord and you got to hold your finger in the tip so that it doesn't just close it all up and you have something to tie around. Um, and that's where the tears usually occur. And uh, that's the number one fail point. It's what I haven't liked about the tissue, about the, sorry, the newsprint that I got from Staples. It tears very easily. It doesn't have sort of tension that keeps it from tearing horizontally. This, surprisingly, good. Um, I used the, uh, I'll tell you about the different uh, twines or threads later. All right, second tissue paper, um, not even a tissue paper, it's, it's a packing paper from a, a package that I got. Um, this one, I didn't, you may have noticed, I didn't leave enough room on the end for this to, um, for let me tie it off very, very well. But here's the thing about this paper. It retains its shape super well. I almost didn't tie it off because I felt like I didn't need to. Um, they don't tie off the powder blanks, by the way, because uh, there's nothing to tie off. So I was like, you know, I could just, as long as I made sure to handle this with care, but I thought, you know what, I'll tie it off. There's a little bit of a nub there. You can see that it's tied off. And uh, holds its shape very well, though, and had no tearing despite how tight it was, because you want this tight. Because um, when, you, when you package this all down into there, you want you don't want there to be extra air in and around the paper between the paper and the ball um, that creates less uh, force in the ignition. All right, third one I did, newsprint, super effective. Oh my gosh, um, probably don't need to do this ever again by buying extra paper because the newsprint was very effective, retains its shape, did not tear. Good thing to know. I've already told you about my feelings about the the newsprint that I get from Staple. I'm gonna got a like hundred sheets of it so I'll be doing that one for years but it's not really my favorite 
The winner for me so far is this new masking tape. So this tape, masking paper that I got from the local paint shop. This is different than the paper that I've been using from Jefferson Arsenal. Uh, the Jefferson Arsenal paper is a little bit thicker than this and crumples and crinkles in ways th that don't retain the shape. This one, solid, didn't tear at all as I was you know, tying it off, twisting it off, and tying it off. So I'm really, I think I might, and again, I've got enough paper here to make a thousand of these probably easily, So, which is fine. Um, so that's my review of the papers. I'm going to go ahead and fill these with powder. I'm going to do 110 um, grains each, and uh, then next time I get a chance to fire them, I'll fire them, I'll let you know how they went, but I don't see any reason why they'd be problematic. Oh, now my report on the threads. So, like I said, I've been using the 10 weight um, thread, which is this extra thick one. It's too thick, it could get messed up inside the barrel, cause a problem, so, um, and I will trim these before I uh, take them out onto the range to shoot them, but... Um, Going to the 30 was too fine. It's actually hard to get a hold of all the pieces and tie them. My fingers can't get a hold of them. So the linen thread, even though it's also, it's actually a 35, but because it's an unbleached and unwaxed thread, it actually is easier to handle. It has more grit to it. It means that your fingers don't slip as you're trying to tie things off uh, with this small thread. I might look for a 20 thread, a 20 gauge uh, linen thread and make that my standard because I just like the way th like even when you're trying to cinch it down on the paper It grips the paper because it's got a little bit of of texture to it as opposed to the cotton which just slides right off All of the stuff. So I think I'm getting there if I had to say perfect Would be this masking paper with I would say a 20 weight unbleached on or 20 gauge unbleached un uh, waxed linen thread and that would be my preference. Now these are all 69 caliber balls. Uh, I've been shooting the 71s as well, just to see if there's any difference in accuracy that I get. Uh, if you've seen my previous videos, it kind of didn't matter so much. My issue is I need to learn how to aim and handle the weapon uh, more so than, than, you know, sweat over these kinds of things. So stay tuned for more stuff coming up. Pretty soon I'll have all this done. I'll have, I just got my buckles put on my leather shoes to match the colonial period. I put my wool stockings on for the first time with my garters. Uh, looking fancy. There's a picture of that right there. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, call me a tease, whatever. A couple more things coming up though in the next month. I, I've hinted before and I've shown directly. I have a couple of things to share, uh, which I have still not unboxed. This one I mentioned before I have opened, but I have done nothing with. And this is a Pedersoli um, Kentucky pistol. So this is a flint flintlock pistol. I gotta get a flint for that one, which I have in my stuff. This is an octagonal barrel. Um, very, very heavy weight to this guy. Um, I'm very excited. I'm going to take this all apart and get this wood sanded. And then I've got my boiled linseed oil so that I can uh, soak that in. I'll probably add a little bit of stain to the oil to give it a... Although this wood has a nice dark color to it, so maybe I don't need to add any stain to it. But a little bit of sanding work. I will do all of that in a video and share that later this month. I don't know how long that'll take because I'm just so busy with so many other things. But just kind of excited to see how this works. Uh, you've got a much smaller pan here, and vent, here's your frizzin, um, and just a much smaller flint, all more compact, but man, this thing weighs. It's got some weight to it. So I'm excited to try this out. That'll all be happening in the month of April as well. I still have not unboxed my Kibler rifle, and I'm so excited about that, but I just haven't had time. Um, I've got tax day coming up too, so i got to finish my taxes. But so many things to do. Probably going to put the Kibler rifle off for another couple of weeks. But man, when I get that out, I am going to be so engrossed in it and nothing else. I'll sign off by showing just a little piece of the Concord Minutemen participating in a Concord Town uh, event where they were asked to come in with fife and drum uh, to inaugurate the ceremony that they were participating in. It was really exciting to see. All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.